Home at last. I breathed out a sigh of relief. I had just come home after another utterly exhausting day, spent trying to teach the students who, quite frankly, did not want to be taught. It was a painstaking experience, yet somehow rewarding. And the only real thing keeping me all together at this point was my beautiful girlfriend, Jennifer. I met Jennifer just over a year ago now, and, well, it was her who was there for me, waiting on the sofa every night I came home from work, ready to spend the evening watching movies together. Jennifer, I'm home! I shouted as I turned my key into the lock, only to realize the door was unlocked. I walked in, pushing the door aside with the keys. The sofa was empty. She wasn't there. Considering she had been in the same place every single day without fail for a year, I have to admit I was rather shocked, even a little anxious. Jennifer? I called out a little quieter this time. My eyes had been transfixed on the fridge door, staring at a note stuck to it. I paced over to it, my heartbeat steadily increasing, and grabbed the note. It was printed out. Dear beloved Tobias, I had to leave for an urgent business trip and will be gone for the next two days. Miss me, for I will be back on Friday. Can't wait to see you. Lots of love, Jennifer. Back on Friday? Out for business? What? Jennifer worked at a local cafe in town nearby. How could she possibly be needed there for two days straight? It baffled me and I had a hell of a lot of trust in Jennifer, so whatever she was up to, I'm sure it was nothing. I guess I could catch up on some action movies. Jennifer hated those. My smile lightened up, but my eyes stayed solemn, and still, something felt off. I decided to ignore it for now. The next day. Morning, Toby. Had a good evening yesterday? One of the other teachers, Paul, spoke to me with a harsh glare. Yeah, fine, thanks. Uh, my girlfriend's out of town, so yeah, it was a little bit lonely, but she's back on Friday. He chuckled. <laughs> yeah, it's always like that, isn't it? His glare faded and reassumed drinking his morning coffee. Yeah, I giggled a little under my breath, like Paul had been in any kind of relationship in his lifetime with that coffee breath. Did you hear about the new teacher? A voice in the corner of the staff room whispered. Yeah, I heard she just transferred in. It'll be nice to have someone new around the place, Paul said. My footsteps beat heavily against the blue carpeted floor in the hall, a direct contrast to the quiet taps of the woman walking ahead of me, appearing to have just walked out of the head office. I was about to hurry and greet her, but her hair, such a violent shade of red. It stopped me dead in my tracks, and I froze for a moment. Her hair reminded me of someone I wish I had forgotten. My ex, Amelia. Amelia was the devil. Satan's accursed, evil incarnated. There were so many words I could use to describe her, but it seemed those related to the devil himself were barely enough to convey the horrors that lied within that vile creature I had once deemed my lover. I broke up with her long ago and moved far away. I didn't want her following me, and remembering just some of the torture she put me through seemed like enough to make my eyes water and my legs chatter in fear of her return. Often when I would return from work, she would follow me without my knowledge just to make sure I wasn't cheating. She would plant pills in my food that increased anxiety and drowsiness in me to keep me dependent on her. At night, she would stare at me, waiting for me to fall asleep, and then take my phone and go through every single message, scanning them for any signs of cheating. I wasn't my own person, it seemed. I was hers. No, 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 no. I stopped myself. I was in such a good place right now, I couldn't possibly even put the thought of her in my mind. I couldn't take it. She left scars so unimaginable to the average person that only those with a similar story could understand. But I certainly needed to know whether the lady down at the end of the corridor was Amelia, for my own sake. 
and for the sake of Jennifer. I knocked against the wooden bulwark of a door. Come in. I heard a deep voice call out. I hurried in and slammed the door shut behind me as quickly as I could. What the devil are you doing, Tobias? Mr. Puffin, the head, was now standing up from his chair, staring at me with his jaw wide open. The new teacher. Who is she? I regained civility and walked calmly over to him, though my heart was beating too fast for me to contain it for very long. Ah, yeah, you mean Scarlet. She'll be joining your department, Tobias. Please, take good care of her. She seems incredibly eager, and I want it to stay that way. Maybe her attitude will rub off on some of the students. My eyes sunk, and I breathed a deep sigh of relief. Oh, whew, okay, yeah, no problem at all. I, I, I was just a little surprised when I saw her. Uh, she reminded me of someone I knew from a while back. He nodded, and before his mouth could open, the bell rang, and it was time for lessons. The next day came around yet another evening of being alone. It was Friday, and thankfully Jennifer would be back. Two long nights had passed without her, and I really did need her. I felt so lost without her. I walked into the school, my smile seeming to reflect off the very windows of the corridor as I trekked onwards to my classroom. The bell rang soon after I had reached, and students stormed in like a stampede of wildebeests. They seemed oddly excited today, for learning, I hoped. They sat down momentarily, and the classroom died in silence. The entire room appeared to have engulfed in misery, yet an air of anticipation ruled the skies. Mr. Norfolk, one of the girls in the front called me as I began opening up the PowerPoint lesson. Yes, Carrie, I asked. Do you know the new teacher, Mrs. Scarlet? We all think she likes you. My heart felt as though the vessels had all disconnected. My world was vanishing into the dark void of fear as I heard the muffled sounds of students laughing in the background. You mean, you mean the teacher with red hair? I was verging on collapsing. Please, don't let it be her. Yes, sir. We all heard she really misses you. That was it. I hushed them. Continue with the lesson until the second bell rang and then the students left. I grabbed the bin and vomited. Suddenly, I wasn't feeling very well. I had this really bad feeling. I drove home that night knowing that I had to tell everything to Jennifer. I hid Amelia from her for so long. I didn't want her knowing what horrors lied in my past, but perhaps I should have. It was going to be all too difficult to explain that my ex was a dangerous criminal, and we needed to move now. Once I parked outside, I rushed to the apartment as quickly as I could. Taking a second glance, however, I ran back to my car and took something out of my glove box for precaution. She had already found what school I worked in, what was stopping her from finding my house. I continued running back up the stairwell, and upon reaching the door, I called out, Jennifer! Jennifer, pack your things! There's someone after us! I don't know how long we have, but... Hello, Toby. Everything went numb. The space around me had gone. Only the sofa and who was on it was in my focus now. I couldn't breathe. Well, why are you just standing there, honey? Don't you miss me? Come here, and I'll give you a big old kiss to make up to you. That foul witch. What did she do to Jennifer? Where the hell is Jennifer? I shouted. My veins were bursting with venomous blood. Right here, Toby. Take a look. Amelia showed me a video which showed Jennifer's whole body buried inside the earth. Only her head was out. What have you done to her? Where is she? I screamed. This is the garbage you've been seeing? <laughs> My dear Toby. As we speak, the garbage is going to the place where it belongs. Amelia laughed, then smashed her phone into the wall. 
Fear gripped me as I saw her face. The devil inside her had come out. You chose that sack of shit over me? How could you? You think you can have your fun with me and then dump me like a piece of shit for another woman? And when I confronted you, you published my intimate pictures on Reddit. You destroyed my life, Toby. I wasn't always like this, but because of what you did and those pills you stuffed into me, I turned into a monster. Her eyes darted towards the window as she spoke. You think only you can play the victim card? Those were the last words spoken by Amelia. Then she jumped out of the window. The next day, I received an email from the university. It was a termination letter sent by Mr. Puffin. Apparently, Amelia had revealed everything with solid proof to my university, as well as the police. I was arrested in no time. I later came to know that Jennifer was safe and left the house only because Amelia asked her to. <sighs> Amelia was crazy. She could never understand that men have needs. We gotta do what we gotta do. I know you would understand, my dudes. She destroyed my relationship as well as my reputation. I hope she rots in hell. Kenzie was my girlfriend, and I was in love with her. She was like flowers. She brightened up my entire world. I could say fate brought us together because we kept meeting at different places coincidentally. We met at a friend's party, then at school, at the park, and finally, she became my new neighbor. I approached her first. She was lovely with her chestnut hair and bright smile. Hey, um, I'm David. I've been seeing you around, I said. She introduced herself to me, and we hit it off from there. We started dating two weeks later, and we had three weeks of pure bliss. She was the perfect girlfriend. She knew everything I needed. She couldn't do without seeing me every day. I had a sociology class at the university, and we were placed in groups to work on a project. My partner was a nice girl, Melanie. Our project, including having a focus group discussion with a bunch of teenagers. Melanie and I had to spend some time together to create a plan. I was so deep into planning that I had forgotten to tell Kenzie that I would be late. She had moved into my apartment and I knew she would be worried. I excused myself from Melanie. I called Kenzie several times, but... It kept going to voicemail. I started to get worried. I excused myself from Melanie again and hurried home. I typed in the code to my apartment and walked in to find Kenzie on the floor. Shards of glass everywhere. With some pictures on the floor. I was terrified. Did, did she slip and fall? I moved closer with trepidation. Kenzie was breathing fine. Her eyes were wide open. Kenzie, what are you doing on the floor? I managed to say. She didn't respond, so I moved closer. That was when I saw the pictures. Lots of pictures of Melanie and me. Each picture showed us together at different times and places. Do you still love me? She said in a monotone. Kenzie, what is this? She sat up from the floor and walked to the cabinet and began to throwing things at me. She repeated her previous question, and I shouted that yes, I did love her. I told her that I was madly in love with her. She stopped throwing stuff and walked over to me, walking barefoot on the broken glass. She wrapped her hands around my waist and looked up at me with glistening eyes. Who's that girl? She's my project partner, I responded with a touch of fear. I don't like her. Get rid of her, she said and kissed me. I loved Kenzie. I did, and I was sure that she was the best girl for me. But 
I should have told her about Melanie. The next day, I told my professor that I wasn't comfortable with my project partner and I wanted to change. The professor gave me a male partner instead. And then there was peace between Kinsey and me for a while. We had a few squabbles, but they got sorted out pretty easily. I found out that Kinsey was a jealous person. She couldn't stand seeing me with another woman. She followed me around, and I began to wonder if she was truly a student at my school. I knew how she woke up in the middle of the night to scroll through my messages. I knew it wasn't healthy, but I thought maybe she just needed to affirm that I really did love her. I thought that things would get better over time, but they only got worse. One night, I confronted Kenzie about her nightly phone checking, and she went berserk. She screamed at me and threatened to kill me and herself. I held her close and begged her to be calm. She stopped screaming, and I told her to forgive me. I never confronted her about it again, but that incident got me worried. I couldn't continue this way, so I tried to think up a solution. I was stuck with this psycho girl that was extremely obsessed with me. I was cut off from my friends and family because of Kenzie. She was so needy. She always wanted me to be with her. I decided to take a break, so I left one morning and told her I was going to the gym. I took my car and drove over a hundred kilometers to my parents. It was like a breath of fresh air. I hadn't seen my parents since Kenzie came into my life almost a year ago. I got to see my old friends and hung out with my cousins. I had missed this life and I forgot all about Kenzie. Almost. She kept calling me and bothering me. I blocked her, but she used different numbers. Fear began to grip me when she sent a picture of my bedroom. The sheets, bed, and duvet had all been slashed into pieces. Kenzie needed help. I had called the police and informed them about a girl with psychological issues and they assured me that they were going to visit my apartment. I finally felt at peace. Kenzie was off my heels. The rest of the summer went smooth, and I forgot all about my ex-girlfriend. Then, I met a girl in August. Her name was Leela. She was very different from Kenzie. She wasn't needy or overbearing. She was pretty nice. I caught a glimpse of someone. It was a girl. She had red hair, but she looked a lot like Kenzie. It wasn't possible. She was supposed to be in a mental hospital. My evening was pretty much ruined, and I told Leela that I had to leave early. I drove home and got a notification. It was a message from Kenzie. I opened it, and it was a picture of Leela on a chair. She was tied and gagged. There was a message beneath the picture. Miss me? Come over to Leela's house, baby. I'll be waiting. I dashed out of my room and jumped into the car. Leela was in trouble, and it was all my fault. I got to Leela's and shakily rang the doorbell to her house. I was terrified, deathly afraid. I couldn't imagine what Kenzie would do to her. The door was open to reveal Kenzie. She had red hair now. She was the girl I had seen at dinner. She smiled at me and let me in. She looked pleased to see me. She asked how I was doing and led me to the bedroom where Leela was tied to the chair. Her eyes were wide with shock. She probably thought that I had planned it all with Kenzie. I wasn't the Joker, but Kenzie definitely was Harley Quinn. She was insane. Kenzie forced me to kiss her in front of Leela. She was holding a knife. I didn't want her to hurt Leela, but I needed to do something about this situation. I held Kenzie close to me and told her that I had missed her. I kissed her and she let her guard down. I seized that moment 
and grabbed the knife from her hands and pushed her against the wall. She was in shock. I caught her by surprise. She was angry, and she tried to take the knife from me. I pushed her again, and we began to struggle. She cussed and railed at me. She bit my arm and screamed. I pushed her, and she fell. When she fell, she hit her head on the bed frame and knocked out. I hurried to Leela's side and released her. She was sobbing as I called the police. It turned out that Kenzie was an obsessive stalker. She wasn't even a student. This time, I made sure that Kenzie would be locked up for a very long time. I rolled over on the bed and reached my hand across the bed half awake. The cozy warmth of sleep had tucked me in a dreamy reverie that I was hesitant to shake myself from. I groped further on the bed when I felt her absence and I thrashed about carelessly. Our small custom of cuddling until we were fully awake had become such a part of me that I immediately sensed something was off. I opened my eyes and sure enough she wasn't on the bed with me. Babe? I called as I turned in the tussled bed. There was no answer to my call, and I rubbed my eyes with my fingers. My dazed state slipped slowly away from me, and I began to realize where I was alone in the lightless room. The familiar smell of the room I had grown up in, far away from my noisy apartment in the city, made my stomach flutter. It was this simple room which had formed me into the man that I was, fitting for such a perfect girlfriend as Lola. An image of her eager blue eyes filled my gaze and it made me smile. Lola was every inch of perfection. I pondered what I would have done without her every time I suffered a loss or celebrated a win. And in the recent months since we had met, I had suffered such a terrible loss. Three of my closest friends had died on a trip, and I had not been made aware of the incident until the police had called me in for questioning. Sorrow made me queasy. I tossed myself about towards the bed's edge. Lola was steadfast, and it was all that mattered to me. I blinked and stared up at the ceiling briefly for orientation. I was glad I'd taken the break to return home to my parents in this small, familiar room where I felt safe. Memories of recent hours flashed into my mind, and it made me smile a little. My parents obviously adored Lola, even though she'd been awkward around them. I was so happy they could tell she loved me, just as I had told them. It would all be okay, child. Dad assured me hours ago, and I had a sense that it would be just as he had said. Yet I could not shake off the thought that my friends had been killed in a carbon monoxide poisoning in the car they went with. The police told me they'd received a phone call, which I did not make, inviting them over to an event which I was having. My alibi at the time it checked out, and it was only that realization that had saved me from being remanded. My life had suddenly turned on its head. The same friends that I would move the earth for had all died at the same time, and a small stain of guilt was on my conscience. It was Lola who had driven me in her car and packed a bag we would need for the trip. It would all be okay, child. Dad's assurance rang in my ears again as I tumbled over in the bed and planted my feet on the floor in a dizzy motion. I staggered with considerable care towards the toilet and pushed it open. It was dark, so I groped the wall for the switch. My fingers found it instinctively, and it clicked. The light flickered briefly. Not nearly enough for me to find my way into the bathroom, and I groaned. I wondered why no one told me about the light. My mind went straight for Lola, and perhaps she'd gone out to find another toilet for herself. I stepped away from the door and meandered back into the room. I stood in front of the bed, and suddenly had a change of mind when I sensed I needed to empty my bladder. I exited the room to an enveloping silence, which made me stop in my tracks. A putrid smell wafted into my nostrils in the corridor that led to my parents' room, and it jerked all of my slumbering senses awake. Babe? I called again as I walked towards the door. My body 
quivered as I walked towards my parents' room with careful stealth. The smell was stronger the closer I walked, almost too foul for me to contain myself, and I reached my hands out to the wall to stop myself from buckling under the strong smell. I slipped my shirt from my body and wrapped it around my face to stop the smell. Mom? Dad? I called into the room. An unadulterated dread suffocated me as I entered into my parents' room to find it utterly covered with a strong, gaseous fume. The fumes stung my eyes, and I blindly managed my way to their bedside. When I was there, my worst horrors were confirmed. Mom and Dad lay on the bed, cold and lifeless, and I could not tell who was who in the fumes. My heart jumped. The horrors of my days were wrapped in a small punch that sunk into my chest and I unraveled quickly. I fell to my knees beside the bed, succumbing to the fumes. I picked myself and dragged myself slowly out of the room with only one thought in mind, to call the cops. My stomach was in disarray, as were all of my other senses. Someone was out to get me, and I was scared for my life and for Lola's. Lola! I muttered in panic as I stepped out of the room. You shouldn't have gone in there. Now look at you, my poor baby. I heard Lola's voice from beside me. Come, I'll help you get better. Lola! I hollered in relief. And then I recoiled in disbelief when her words sunk into my senses. The pieces started to fall in place like slow, trickling water. They had to die too. I'm sorry. I can't afford to share you with anyone else. She confessed with a casualness that struck me. My eyes shot wide. I can't stand it. I can't stand you giving attention to anyone else. It kills me inside. What? I barked when the idea finally clicked. She was the terror. She was the danger. What? She queried back with a look of consternation in her face, a look of utter innocence, as though she did not fully appreciate the horror she had committed. My psycho girlfriend stood in front of me and said, Death was easy for all of them. She stepped forward, and I reacted instinctively to protect myself from this demon. I pulled her closer to myself and grabbed her by her head. I slammed her face into the wall. She went stiff at once as she fainted, and I let her body drop to the ground. Shit! 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 I iterated as I ran away from the body and quickly to the room to fetch my phone. Now, more than ever, I perceived an urgent need for safety. I wasn't thinking, and nothing made sense at once. I knew I had to call the cops and report the psycho girlfriend killer. My grandparents were dead. They had been dead for over 20 years and they left the house to my parents. My mom died from cancer five years ago and my dad remarried last year. He and his new wife moved to Amsterdam. It was summer and I decided to leave the school dormitory. I thought it would be fun to visit my grandparents' old house. I hadn't been there since my grandparents' death and my uncle, who lived in town, took care of that huge house. I drove into the sleepy town with adventure on my mind. I got to the house and met it in good shape. Memories flooded my mind as I walked into the house. Memories of my grandma and my grandpa. They died when I was small, but I remembered many things about them. I also remembered that the circumstances concerning their death had been mysterious. My parents refused to talk about it, and we never returned to the house. But I was back and determined to find out what might have killed my grandparents. Once I had settled into the master bedroom, I dialed a call through to my dad. Why did you go to the house? You should have stayed in school. He was irked, but I paid no attention. I only wanted him to know where I was. I wasn't a little boy anymore. I could take care of myself. I spent the first night at a local pub. I met up with my uncle and we had a nice chat. He advised me to stay with him instead, but he wouldn't say why. Everyone seemed to avoid that house. The first night, I slept peacefully. 
although I expected to have nightmares due to the eeriness surrounding the house. I found my granddad's study, and it was filled with books. I perused the shelves until a book caught my attention. I pulled it out of the shelf and sat down at the oak table. It looked like an old notebook. I opened it, and the first page read, The Testament of Donald Michaels. It was my grandfather's, and it was written the year he and my grandmother died. So I began to read. The story began when my grandparents moved into that house. They were newly married with a daughter, Lynn. It sounded strange because I never knew they had a daughter. My grandfather had found the house and bought it cheap. They settled in and began enjoying the town. With time, my grandmother began to notice changes in their daughter. She stopped smiling and began to lock herself up in her room. They thought the transformation was due to the change in the environment, so they dismissed it. My grandmother eventually gave birth to my father a year after they arrived at the house, and my uncle came along two years later. My grandparents focused on their little boys without noticing that Lynn grew worse every day. She was almost 18 when she began to sleep in the basement. My grandmother tried to help her, but it seemed like nothing could be done. They were scared of taking her to a psychiatric facility due to the horrible treatment of the patients. Lynn continued to get worse in the basement, and her brothers called her the basement monster. She ate and slept in the basement. Everyone who asked after her was told that she had traveled to Europe. With time, people stopped asking questions. My dad and his brother grew up and left the house while Lynn remained in a terrible state in the house. She was fed and cared for by her parents and my grandfather swore to take care of her for the rest of his life. I dropped the book with shaky hands with the sudden realization. Was, was she still in the basement? I now understood why everyone dissuaded me from staying in the house, but I had a knack for adventure, so I decided to investigate. I had never been to the basement of the house. I searched and found the inconspicuous door for stairs that led into the basement at the end of the house. I was met with silent noises. Then, growls and gnarls could be heard from the room. I suddenly became fearful. Was someone truly there, or was it simply a story that my grandfather had cooped up and I was just hearing things? I was a bit scared and returned back to the bedroom. I had enough for adventure for the day. My uncle had earlier invited me for dinner at his house, so I drove over. He was divorced, so he lived alone, and I guess my company was a breath of fresh air for him. I got to his house and knocked on the door. There was no response from him, so I tried to call his number. It went to voicemail, and I began to get worried. I got into my car and was about to return home when he eventually showed up. He was sweating, and I made a joke that he looked like he'd been wrestling. He laughed nervously and apologized for keeping me waiting. He said he had been called to the hotel he owned due to an emergency. He opened the door, and I noticed fresh scratch marks on his arm. He caught me staring at the arm and assured me that it was nothing. He had ordered some food for both of us and we spoke about different memories. We finished dinner and were doing the dishes when I brought up the book that I found in the study. My uncle's face turned grim and he told me that I needed to leave the house immediately. Eventually I went back home to the big house and I had looked up to see if there was a psychiatric facility nearby. I called their number and told them that a mentally ill person was in the house. I was told to confirm the person's state, so I had no other option but to visit the basement. I took slow steps down the stairs. It was extremely quiet. Strange drawings and words filled the walls and one caught my attention. I killed mommy and daddy, it said. 
Newspaper clippings were on the floor, and one had a catchy headline. The Strange Deaths of the Michael Couple. I picked it up and began to read. It contained the mysterious circumstances around my grandparents' death. The paper said that they had been killed by their mentally unstable daughter. She was placed in a facility after their death, but seemed to be better after several years, so they decided to let her go. She remained in the house and was cared for by her family. My fingers shook in shock when I turned back only to meet a woman with matted hair and dirty hands staring at me. I lost my balance and fell down. She fell to her knees after me and began to strangle me. I struggled and tried to escape her grasp, but she was too strong for me. My eyes began to blur. Then the woman fell next to me. Through blurry eyes, I could see my uncle holding a stick. I told you to leave the house, he said. He held me up and ran out of the basement. My uncle called an ambulance to pick Aunt Lynn up. She was injured, but she survived. They once again admitted her to a psychiatric facility and the house was put up for sale. Do you want to buy it from us? 